Hello! This is the first of three videos that I'm preparing for you, uh, screen captures, uh, to talk about our next assignment, which is expressive slash symbolic slash conceptual portraiture. I know that's a lot, and uh, it, I don't expect for you to do all three of those things. Um, but I want to, and I'm going to try to break it down for you, but I want to emphasize that these areas are all connected. And the images that I'm going to show you and the artists that I'm going to talk about, I hope will just inspire you to find your own place within this. Don't worry about precisely where it fits, but think about this as an opportunity to really go off on a new adventure and do something quite different and quite um, um, a little bit off the beaten path for portraiture. This first slideshow is going to be about expressive and symbolic portraiture, and then there'll be a video about conceptual portraiture, and then the last video will be a very short video that uh, just uh, shows and describes some previous student projects in this area. So let's get started. We actually looked at these in the last class just briefly, um, but I want to backtrack and uh, get covering this now. And by the way, I, I want to say that this assignment is a really good one for our first uh, our first assignment online in this strange new world, uh, because this is something I think you'll see from all of the different examples that you can very easily find a way to work with this at home. You can do self portraiture. Uh, you can uh, photograph uh, someone who's quite nearby, someone who you're close to, uh, maybe pets, uh, let's see, and maybe we can even get into portraiture that doesn't absolutely precisely include um, a real person subject. Hmm. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of leave, judgment, leave that open for now. We'll have a conversation about it as we get going. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is Clementina Howarden. Clementina Howarden was a 19th century photographer, fine art photographer. She was a contemporary of Julia Margaret Cameron. And uh, she's a fascinating woman. She was very conscious. Uh, she was a feminist and she was very conscious of the limited role that even uh, well-to-do women during this time period were allowed to play in the world. And uh, there was a particular ennui of women who uh, had resources or, or lived in comfort, uh, but were cloistered at home and didn't have a lot of outlet for their, uh, for their faculties, for their intelligence, for their creativity, and for, their, for other activities. So these portraits that, I'm, that she made are all uh, symbolic and expressive portraits related to that uh, challenge, that difficulty. Any of the little marks and artifacts you see here in the cuts, these are uh, these are scans of the original photos that have survived. So these are little um, marks and damage that have that they've suffered, but they're still quite beautiful. She has beautiful composition, extraordinary use of light, and I think that the just the 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 mood and the tenor of these, where they describe this life of luxury and boredom, which was really uh, the the main aspect of life for women in the 19th century. Julia Margaret Cameron, we've talked about before. I want to come back and really talk about her expressive and symbolic aspects of her of her portraiture. Uh, she often used references, uh, direct or oblique references, to literature, to stories. This almost seems to reference Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and remember that she was someone who uh, was self-taught, because there was no other way at that point, but also who very quickly recognized that the things that went wrong in photography were actually what made it a very interesting medium, especially for portraiture. So notice how, she, how interestingly she uses depth of field and motion um, and uh, even, even the vignetting and the framing that way. These uh, photos, these next two photos refer somewhat indirectly to the story of Ophelia. She made a number of these from Hamlet. I really like this uh, particular portrait. It gets, it definitely steps away from our traditional notion of a studio portrait, which is 
meant to flatter and uh, make us look happy and serene. And in this photograph, she actually has a woman in the midst of pulling at her hair and furrowing her brow and showing this sort of deep internal angst. So this is a very different kind of portrait, a psychological and internal and emotional portrait. Let's talk now about Man Ray. Now Man Ray was a very interesting photographer who, uh, he was also an artist, he was also a commercial photographer. Uh, he was quite a, an incredible innovator. He was a Dada artist and a surrealist. And as I mentioned, he also worked commercially. He was really extraordinary um, in many ways. He made very interesting, expressive, and psychological and symbolic portraits. This particular uh, photo, which is called um, uh, icy, Ice Tears or Tears of Ice, oh, Glass Tears, excuse me, I'm totally, Glass Tears. He made this after um, one of many breakups with the love of his life, Lee Miller, who was his muse and his, uh, his lab assistant and um, a photographer in her own right. So this is not Lee Miller herself. This is a woman that he spent time with after he broke up with Lee Miller. And he made this portrait of her really in talking about the way that he felt about this breakup. And the glass tears, of course, are... Uh, frozen on the face so that he, he sees her pain as being false pain and his, uh, the, the pain that she inflicts on him as being the real pain. I don't know much about this portrait by Man Ray, but again, it's quite expressive. It's fascinating in that the eyes, which we usually determine to be the most important part of a portrait, are actually shaded. And again, not absolutely sure everything that's happening here, but notice the tiny hands. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism and uh, a sense of the dream world. Of course, Man Ray was a surrealist, so he was interested in uh, the subconscious. He was interested in the dream state. He was interested in these uh, states of consciousness, that, of states of unconsciousness, the things of which we are not directly aware. Multiple exposures. This is another Man Ray. And this is absolutely something I encourage you to experiment with if you're interested. You can do it in camera. You can do it in uh, whatever kind of software you're comfortable using. And you can even do it as a collage of some kind. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you're welcome to experiment. And of course, double or triple exposures reveal this sense of a portrait as being representative of multiple states of mind, not a single stage. Now there's, this is a photographer that I find very interesting and she's gaining a lot of new recognition now. She's a later pictorialist. She was a native Californian. Her name is Anne Brigman. And Anne Brigman uh, was a single woman. She never married. She was very fiercely independent. She loved the outdoors. She loved the natural areas in California, especially uh, the Sierras. And she traveled there on her own. She would hike to the Sierras, sometimes alone, sometimes with her sister. And she would stay there for days and make these really fascinating uh, romantic self-portraits, um, always nude. And these were intended to be comments on uh, the ability of a woman to exist uh, independently. Uh, without being connected to anything but nature. Um, they're really quite uh, quite beautiful. They are feminist. Um, they are romantic and expressive. She would shoot actually in 35 millimeter, um, so they're not quite as like intensely detailed as some of the other photographers from this era. But uh, she would then go in and actually often do a lot of drawing or painting or manipulation afterwards. So they have this really interesting quality of being somewhere between a drawing and a photograph. This is some of her later work. This is a self-portrait of, her, of herself, a double exposure. I really like these. I found these somewhat later. And here is Anne Brigman, another later self-portrait. Now, interestingly enough, as we move on to the next series, 
I have recently learned that Anne Brigman had what was at least a romantic writing relationship with Alfred Stieglitz, which his longtime uh, love of his life and wife, George O'Keefe, I think she knew about it and she chose to not worry about it. Um, so Georgia O'Keeffe is pictured here in a series of portraits by her husband, her very famous husband, Alfred Stieglitz. She was, of course, quite extraordinarily famous herself. And these are, he took these uh, throughout their marriage. They span a number of years and they vary from photographs of her hands, of her body, um, more traditional portraits where we're, sorry, where we're looking at her. Her hands are almost always a part of it. And they cumulatively create this expressive and in part symbolic uh, portrait of both her and his relationship with her. This has always been a favorite of mine. This is simply her hands. And I, I think it's an amazing and simple uh, portrait. Now, the next photographer is Harry Callahan. This is a little bit later. We're getting into the mid 20th century. Harry Callahan also was in a really powerful relationship with a woman named Eleanor, his wife. And he made a number of uh, portraits of her as well as with, her, with their child. And he had this very passionate relationship with her and also uh, was often troubled by what he felt like was his inability to get as close to her as he wanted. And his portraits often reflect that. All of this series of self-portraits that he did of Eleanor are all double exposures. Some have her whole body, some have part of her body. And you may think, well, is it a portrait if it doesn't have her face? I've always found, because these are not simply uh, studies of the shape and form of Eleanor's body, but these are about his relationship with Eleanor, I feel like these travel over into the territory of expressive and symbolic portraiture. Okay, moving into more contemporary work. I have a few, few to show you. I'm going to try to keep this under 20 minutes. Uh, David Hockney, who uh, these are actually older David Hockney, but David Hockney is still making work today. And David Hockney is known primarily as a painter, but he did a long series of what he called joiners, which uh, not all of them are portraits, but many of them are. His paintings are often portraits. And these are made of multiple Polaroids or four by six uh, photographs um, that he physically collages together. And I like these. These show both uh, expressive qualities. This is his mother, I believe. Expressive qualities um, of the, the figure that he's uh, creating. Also relational qualities. And in this case, even environment. This is a commercial version of it. Uh, I can't remember why I threw this in. I just thought, well, that's kind of interesting that David Hockney was actually able to make a little bit of money by doing a little fashion shoot with his grids. This is a self-portrait in that same mode. Now, some of David Hockney's joiners are made up of a hundred different photos, um, but some of them are quite simple, like this one, which is only really about 15 photos. And again, they are collaged together. These are Polaroids. And this is another one of his mother. These are a series of getting more into contemporary photography. Uh, this is a series by an artist, Alison Belcher, who happens to be a friend of mine. And she did a series of self-portraits. She also uh, had experimented a little bit with doing portraits of others with a pinhole camera in a studio. So these are very long exposures, uh, not with strobe, uh, with very little light. She just moved very slowly. She has a background in dance, as did her mother. So these are really expressing both her sense of movement and dance and also her um, sometimes 
challenging relationship with her mother, who's since passed, who had passed on before this. These were taken on a Polaroid Type 55, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. So taken in a 4x5 pinhole camera and uh, developed and printed as uh, dark in the dark room. This is one of the ones that she has of a, of a friend, another dancer. This is a very uh, strange and interesting artist, um, uh, Loretta Lux. And uh, nobody's quite sure how Loretta Lux makes her uh, photo, uh, her manipulated photo portraits of children. They're very strange. And I, I'm almost uncertain about whether to call them portraits. I'm not sure that they are about these children. I think that there are that they're children standing in for some kind of adult self that isn't present in them. Uh, she takes up to a year to make these individual ones. Uh, she combines uh, many different techniques. They're large scale. Um, they're always just a little bit strange. Painterly. She uses backgrounds. I think she does do some actual painting on them. They're melancholy. Quite surreal. This is one of her more famous ones from this series, this little girl who really doesn't seem to be very young. This is Lucas Samaras, and uh, this is a fairly old series by Lucas Samaras, but uh, still rather contemporary. He's still around today, uh, but I think he's making films these days. He made these with a very old type of Polaroid that you could actually manipulate the emulsion. So this isn't, you can't do this exact process today, uh, but uh, there, I think there's a lot to be said here for ideas about maybe painting or drawing or scratching on photos or working with them even in software. These are all self-portraits. Some of them are these close-ups of his face where he's actually manipulated almost everything out except just a hint of the eyes. They're fairly grotesque and disturbing. Uh, he seems to have a really challenging relationship with himself. This is probably one of my favorites where he really uh, pushes the boundaries between painting and photography. I forgot I put so many of them in here. Sorry about that. I was going to delete a few. Okay, and the last artist I think many of you will appreciate. Uh, this is uh, uh, Francesca Woodman, uh, who recently became quite famous. She unfortunately died very young. She killed herself at the age of, I believe, 23. So she didn't have a long working life, but she was quite a prodigy. There's, I believe, a movie came out a few years ago. Uh, she did mostly self-portraits, um, and most of this was done while she was still in college at RISD in Rhode Island. Um, these are, uh, well, I'll just let you take a look at them. They're melancholy, they're imaginative, they're a bit disturbing. She uses empty rooms. She did a whole series here where she's using such a slow shutter speed that she almost vanishes. Mirrors. This is actually one of the few ones that is not a self-portrait. Uh, when she was working in Italy, uh, there was another woman that was a subject for her. And these were all done, of course, in um, black and white film. Great one to look up. Okay, I made it in another 20, under 20 minutes. I hope these were inspiring for you. Be sure to check my notes if you want to review. Um, I'll be asking you to comment on these in the discussion. 
and um, when you're ready, move on to the next one on conceptual photography.